Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this virtual summit presentation, Co-Requisite Statistics. My name is Danny Shapiro, and I'm on the marketing team here at Hawks Learning. Our speaker today is Professor Jacqueline Jensen Bowen of Lamar University. Dr. Jensen Bowen earned her PhD in low dimensional topology from the University of Oregon in 2002. She's now a tenured associate professor at Lamar University in Beaumont, Texas, where she is currently the director of the first year mathematics experience. She is also editor of MAA Focus, the news magazine of the Mathematical Association of America. In addition to her mathematical career, she is a knitter and a dance mom to her twins. We're excited to have you here. Um, audience, if you do have any questions during the webinar, please enter those into the Q&A box located on the panel at the bottom of your screen, and we will address them at the end of the talk. And at that note, I wanna hand it over to our presenter. So thank you. I'm going to assume, Danny, that I'm live. Um, this is not the way that I thought this talk was going to be going, right? Like, they asked me to talk about what's going on with co-requisite statistics at Lamar University, and I did not really think that we'd all be joining from webinars from wherever we are, um, many of us experiencing some social distancing. So um, welcome, and I hope you all are doing well and healthy. Um, I wanted to tell you a little bit first about um, the background about Lamar University. Um, Lamar is a regional state school. Uh, we're part of the Texas State University system. We have about 14,000 students, 2,400 of them are first year. We have a large, um, large group of minority students. We have 25% African American, 18% Latinx. Um, those numbers are growing. Our Latinx population is growing faster than any other population on campus. Um, we are split between being a residential school and a commuter school and an online school. So we serve all kinds of people um, with lots and lots of people being returning students. Um, so a little history. Um, in fall 2017, before the Texas State uh, House Bill 2223 came in line, we had three levels of remediation in mathematics. We had math um, 0370, which is college math. It was like for people who were not yet up to algebraic levels. We had beginning algebra, with, which was math 0371, and then we had intermediate algebra with 0372. And those were the courses that our students needed to take before they took any other math courses on campus if they were not college ready. Um, for us in Texas, that's the TSI score. Um, you can see the numbers in parentheses there. So in fall of 2017, we had 434 students who were in remediation. Um, that's not a good picture out of our 2,400 first year students. Um, it's a large proportion. The students starting at college math would have at least three semesters before they ever got to a college level course. And as we all know, that's not very effective. But to make things even worse, um, the old policy was if they attempted a developmental course and failed it twice, they would move backwards. So in other words, if you had a student, I'm gonna go back to the previous slide. If you had a student who started out in beginning algebra and failed it twice, they would bump back down to college math even if they had originally placed into beginning algebra. Same thing, and then they could work their way up. So if they started in college math and passed and took beginning algebra and passed and then took intermediate algebra and failed it twice, they would go back to beginning algebra. If they failed that twice, they would go back to college math and start the whole thing again. So we had one student in particular who would spend 14 semesters in our remediation path. It was really, really a bad plan. Um, so the House bill came online in fall of 2018 was when it went into effect. And it said we need to have a certain proportion of our students who are not college ready in a co-requisite. So it was 25% in fall of 2018. It was 50% in fall of 2019, and it will be 75% in fall of 2020. Um, the original bill, for those of you who don't know, asked us to have 100% of our co students, of our not college ready students in co in fall of 2020. So they did dial that back a little bit. Um, it's still a pretty high standard, I think. Um, so, you know, we, we got this house bill and we had to figure out how many students is this going to affect? How many of our courses require co-requisites? Um, at the time, 
we were running college algebra and a separate pre-calculus class. And then we were running introduction statistics and we'll talk a lot more about that in the next bit. Um, and then we just started a contemporary math course, a quantitative reasoning course online um, that was not running face to face at the time. So it, it was a little bit cumbersome to think about how many different courses were going to need co-requisites. Um, that question has actually gotten harder instead of easier, which is great fun. Um, and then the other question is how do we appropriately place students into their co-recs? So in other words, um, what's the right cut point? If we have to correct so many students, how do we ensure success, right? We weren't wanting to just dump all of them in. Um, so it was funny because that summer that we were rolling out the COREX, the, the where summer we got word about the Texas bill, um, House Bill 2223, was the same that next fall we got hit with Hurricane Harvey. And so we were trying to make plans and we were on campus and I ran into the provost and he was like, how's it going? I was like, it's a great opportunity for growth. And he was like, okay. Um, and it has been a great opportunity for us. Um, we have gotten the chance to really think carefully about what content is in which courses to kind of redesign those courses to resynchronize content. I am so sorry about if you're seeing those pop ups. Um, resynchronize content and really to take an opportunity to form a community of teachers. So what had been happening um, at Lamar and probably a lot of other places is that we had had a lot of instructors who like got the text and maybe got the syllabus and then just went and did whatever they wanted to in class. And we decided that if we were going to have co-mingled co-requisites, so the students were allowed to cross between college level sections to end up in the same co-rec section, that what we were really going to have to do was synchronize those content, the content for those courses. And we couldn't have any more um, people on their own pacing. We couldn't have people not covering the entire syllabus. We had to have the same story between sections. And so it's really given us a chance to kind of start to talk a lot about our teaching and talk a lot about how we cover things in courses and talk a lot about why the course exists. Um, for pre-calculus, for us, that's pretty clear. We have a lot of engineering students. The point of the pre-calculus sequence is really to get them into calculus and make them successful engineering students. Um, it's not so clear what was the story for statistics. And so we really got to talk about that as a group and think about what we wanted that to be. Um, so the first thing we did actually is not super relevant to this particular story, but we went with our highest population courses and that was where college algebra and pre-calculus. Um, intro to stat was not as well populated as we would have liked and we're working on that a lot in terms of the reputation of the course um, and the content of the course. Um, everybody on campus took college algebra if they weren't a STEM major um, and pre-calculus, like I said, was kind of our stream into um, into the engineering courses. And these were also kind of our best established courses. These were the ones that we knew what the content was supposed to be. And so implementing Corex was less terrifying. And so that's what we did first. Um, last spring, oh my gosh, was that just a year ago? Last spring, um, we maintained those and then we added in a Corex for contemporary mathematics. Now, fall, Nope, sorry, spring of 18 was the first time we offered contemporary math face-to-face -face on campus. Um, and so it took us a year to kind of write materials. We we're not using a text to write materials, to test the materials, to add in some extra sections, and then to figure out what the co-rec should look like. That's still kind of a little bit of work in progress. And in spring of 19, I also got to pilot um, a new curriculum for statistics. That section had college ready students only because we weren't ready to roll out a co-rec. Um, and it used the Hawks program. Um, it was a way, here we go. Um, so in fall 17, we had 249 students in intro to statistics. None of them were held in classrooms. They were all using different materials. Some of them were using a certain textbook. Some of them were using no textbook. Some of them were using OpenStax. Some of them were using, I don't even know. Um, but they were all doing um, intro statistics from a hand calculation point of view. So 
everybody that I know of was having students by hand calculate mean, median, mode, standard deviation, everything. Um, and when we started looking at the curriculum, we really thought that was a bit antiquated. Um, in fall 18, we had 220 students, still none in computer classrooms, still using different materials, still using hand calculations. So um, when we started to rewrite it in the pilot that I ran last spring, really was about starting to follow the gaze recommendations. So focusing a lot on statistical literacy, how do we design experiments? How do we design studies? How do we know if we have good survey data? Um, how can we detect bias? How do we interpret results as opposed to how do I calculate all these things? And so we spent last spring working on materials and projects to kind of help students have some contextualization to help them have an idea of what what it all means and when they should believe things and when they shouldn't. And I think the spring is like a real life example of why we need our students to be statistically literate. It's pretty interesting. Um, so we moved all of our intro stat courses into the computer lab. Um, in fall of 19, when we rolled out the COREX, those also started in the computer lab. Um, yeah, the idea is they don't need to calculate by hand anymore. Um, we're trying really, really hard. We have weekly meetings um, for half an hour each where we get all the stat instructors and the co-rec instructors together in a room and talk about, okay, how did this week go? And actually we always start with what went well this week? Did you finish the content? What does next week look like? What do we have to cover? What's our story? What, how do we put it all together? How does it relate to things that came before? What does it preview that's happening later? And then um, what do we really want them to come out knowing? We have started using Excel for calculations. Um, one of the questions a lot of people have and we had for a long time was do we use Excel or do we use R? Um, we decided with our population that R would be way too much coding for them, even if they were drop-in modules, and that um, State of Texas has a really big push for job-ready skills, and that Excel is something people could write on their resumes as, I know how to do things in Excel. We started using super messy, really big data sets, um, where the students had to kind of figure out how to clean the data sets. They had to be able to find calculations on data sets that had two or three hundred rows in them and several hundred columns sometimes. Um, they're super real. Um, not all the data sets are like that. Um, Hawks actually has some really great, I'll show you in a second um, if you don't know where to find them, some really great data sets that you can download for specific examples in class or for specific worksheets if you want to have your students engage that way. Um, and then we were trying to figure out what the co-requisite looks like. And the co-rec has continued to evolve. Um, at first, the co-rec was supposed to be like mini lectures that support the course content. And that was awful. It didn't work well. Um, the students didn't want to listen to another lecture about statistics. What they really wanted was more of a recitation format, um, a Q&A, and some time on Hawks. And so since the co-rec also meets in the computer lab, this semester what we're doing is answering any questions they might have, open worksheets, helping them with projects, which we'll also talk about in a minute, and then really spending some time in Hawks so they can make sure they have their homework done with support where we're standing there answering their questions about things that they're actually seeing. Um, most of our students have figured out that they need to use practice before they use certify, so that's fantastic. So they'll frequently be working on problems that look very similar two or three times during the hour I get them every week the two hours I get them every week. Um, Excel has been interesting and a challenge. One of the things we were not very good about the first semester was um, making sure that we all use the same exact Excel code. So when they ended up in the co-rec, the co-rec instructor had to figure out which code they knew and sometimes introduce new things and that was awful. Um, so we now circulate a list of which code we're using for which procedures. Um, most class days for me and for many of our instructors involve a data set. You walk in, there's a data set posted on your learning management system. They open it and then you ask them a bunch of questions about it or you lead them through how to do something new. 
all of the calculations in, are in Excel. Most of the graphing is in Excel. They do box and whisker plots by hand, but everything else is done in Excel. And so that gives us a chance to really interpret. And so we can really look at what happens when kinds of questions. So one of the things that I do really early is I have them fill out a Google form that's like their age, their number of siblings and something else quantitative, I don't even remember. And so we put it all in one data set and we analyze it together. I post it on their learning management system and they analyze it and we say, okay, so almost everybody in the room is a first year student, everybody's 18, except for these couple of people. Like we have a couple of 40 year olds in the room. So let's look at the mean, median, and mode. And then what happens if we throw out our outliers? Are they outliers? How do we figure that out? Let's get rid of those couple of data points and now look at how it changed the mean, median, and mode. And so they can see interactively how the data sets adjust. Um, so one of my kind of favorite examples to use is these final scores of NBA games. I don't give them the data in this format, by the way. I just tried to make it fit on one screen like so that they don't have to move around too much and that you all can see everything that happens. They get trained really fast that, um, <clears throat> excuse me, every time they see a data set, the first thing they do is calculate the five number summary, the mean and the standard deviation. Um, it's pretty nice. So I give them a data set and I'm walking around making sure everybody gets the data set open and they've already done all these calculations. So they'll have all these calculations over on the side. Um, and this one I really like, um, and I'm pretty sure this came directly from Hawks. I think it's on the next slide. This one I really like because it um, shows the empirical rule really nicely. So they already have the mean and the standard deviation. So you can have them input mean plus standard deviation, mean minus standard deviation. And then you can highlight, I highlight in whatever color, which ones fall in that range. And then we calculate the percentage and it's very, very, very close to 68%. And then they calculate mean plus and minus two standard deviations. And we highlight the extra ones that we get and we calculate the percent that were in that range. And it's very, very, very close to 95%. And I think mean plus and minus three standard deviations, I think we actually get all the data, but since you're predicting 99.7%, that's really not a problem. Um, but it gives them a kind of colorful way to see how the empirical rule might apply to a real set of data. And I think it helps them remember. Um, I'm optimistic anyway, because I do this in class every semester. Um, another data set I really like is this um, SAT data. Um, I gave you the bit.ly if you want to open it and look at it. Um, let's see what does happen if I do that. Um, anyway, you can open it. It's a really nice data set about the um, SAT data and GPA data. So it's good for when you start to look at regression. It allows me, and this is one of the things I think is nice about looking at real data. It allows me to talk about things like, why do we make you take an SAT or an ACT? What is that supposed to tell us? Um, why is this helpful? what do we think? We think SAT data predicts GPA, does it? Do you know anybody who had a low SAT but did just fine in college who had a high SAT and then flunked out? Like, what is this supposed to be about? Why do they use this as a measure? And then we do the analysis on it and we do the um, linear regression on it and see what happens. Um, so, they get the data and then they are given the set of directions. So when I thought I might be doing this in kind of a live format, I was going to like let people do this on their laptop. But um, of course, they're going to do right off the bat, they're going to calculate, I just have to tell them which columns to look at. So they have to calculate the mean of the SAT data. Now, my students would already have calculated mean, median, standard deviation, five number summary, like they would just have that all filled in already. And as a matter of fact, most of them probably by halfway through the semester would have just done that for all of the data columns, not knowing which ones I'm going to want them to look at. Um, one of the things that I find hard and that um, and my students find really hard is like, how do they know how big to make their bins when they're making a histogram? But they can always do that. Um, and so I'm just giving them very specific directions so that they don't have to think about it very much about how big the bins should be. Um, 
and they can therefore just get the picture I want them to get as opposed to everybody getting different pictures and for us to argue about it for 20 minutes because that's not the point of today's lesson. Some days I let them make the histogram and then we fight about it. Who has the best picture? Why would your bin size be that? How many outliers do you have? Those kinds of things. Um, so I've used this for linear regression. I've also used this, as I'm saying here, for um, sampling distributions. So let's randomize the data, pick the first five, and then figure out what the mean is of those five observations you just chose. And then we have everybody in the room do this five or 10 times. I collect their means, and then we plot their means. So they'll see that the sampling distribution gets closer and closer. The mean of the sample means gets closer and closer to the true mean of the population, even if their sample means are off a bit at the beginning. So um, some of these data sets, they see several times during the semester. SAT data happens to be one of them. So everybody's going to give me five or six sample means. And then I have them for this data set because it's probably not super pretty. Um, I have them come up and I have about 36 students. I have them come up and line up and read me their numbers and I enter them all into some part of the Excel spreadsheet. And then we have a sampling distribution. We have the means of the samples that they've collected. And they see that the distribution gets prettier. They see that the mean of the means approaches the true mean. And then we can start to make guesstimates, hypotheses about um, the standard deviation of the sampling distribution. Now I know before anybody says this or yells at me that the samples aren't big enough, but for a classroom exercise, it's, it's kind of effective um, and definitely easier for them to just look at five observations at a time instead of samples of 30. Okay, so the other thing that we have decided to try, and it's something I had done um, when teaching intro stat at Slippery Rock University in Pennsylvania, was to assign them some projects. Um, one of the projects is still undergoing big revision, so that's not the one I'm talking about. Project two is the one that's in here. Um, again, if you want to see the data set, it's at this bit.ly link, so you should be able to get it. Um, I'll show you which questions we ask of them in a second. I'm going to let interested people kind of pull it up first. Um, and then we ask them some very leading questions about it, and then we ask them to write it up in a memo, and we provide them with a sample of the memo. And I'll show you an example in a couple of slides um, where we want them to not just write out their answers to the questions we're asking them, but to really think about how would I present that to my boss? How would I present that if I was asked to summarize this information or conduct an analysis of this information? What information would I give? And the nice thing about a memo for instructors instead of a report is that it's short, so it's easier to grade. Um, I frequently have them work in pairs, so I have usually about 18 of these to read instead of 36. Um, pairs are problematic, as we all know. Um, and I don't, like I tell them, it should only be a page, a page and a half, maybe two pages if you have a lot of analysis and a lot of interesting things to say. So I don't get fluff. You know, if I ask them to write a five page paper or a report about this, I would get lots of like, just fluffy non-statements, whereas if it has to be a page or a page and a half or two pages, then they're much more likely to be clear and succinct. Um, some semesters, I will let them hand in a rough draft. And actually, I tell any students that if they want me to read a draft of their memo before they submit it for final grade, as long as it's before the deadline, that I'm happy to do that. And frequently, the comments are, the statement doesn't refer back to anything important, or there's extra information here that you don't need, or things like that, and it kind of helps. Um, I think for many of our students, especially those taking intro to STAT, they are business majors or going into social science, and so a memo or a summary statement is something that they will all have to write, and it gets back to those job-ready skills that we're really conscious of and trying to promote. Um, I can summarize data. I can put it in a memo. I can write professionally. Is are all good things for our students to be able to do. Um, so for those of you who wanted to open it, here are the prompts. Um, we want them to look at one specific year of data, the, find a histogram about it, find the numerical summary about it. Um, we ask them to fight with the bin size. Now, 
for anybody who's looking at the data set, there are some outliers um, in the population data. And that is something I want them to fight with. I don't tell them that right away, but I have to be prepared for that question. I really want them to realize that if they try to make their bins go from very small countries all the way up through and including China and India and the US, that those numbers, like their histogram looks really weird. And so when I'm asked, or after they've worked on it for a little while, I try to say to them like, you can make a note that your histogram does not include the however many outliers that you're excluding um, and that these questions these countries are not represented in your histogram but the rest of the data looks in this way um, and then they're going to make some conclusions using the mathematical definitions of outliers why they're not including those what the mean looks like with and without those outliers and so on um, they are <laughs> asked to make sure they're using correct notation. We work a lot on notation. And then we ask them to do a hypothesis test or a confidence interval for the last part of the project. And so we ask them to find a new column of data, which are the differences between the 2017 and 2018 populations. They're creating a new column, and now they're looking at those differences. And then they have to come up with a region that they're going to look at and they want to know if the population in their region grows or increases or decreases the same as the overall increase or decrease so they're going to find that um, column of differences they're going to find the mean and standard deviation of that new column and then they're going to sort by the region and compare that region to the overall change um, we want them being careful with whether they're using a z-test or a t-test they should be able to figure that out a lot of them have questions about that that's fine that's good um it's all a matter of how they word things too sometimes so it's kind of interesting some of them will compare two regions even though we don't really do two sample tests so that's fun um but they get to learn something new because that's really the question they want to know um and then they summarize so here's an excerpt um, from a project I got last fall. Um, some of them are really, really, really well written. Some of them are requiring some editing. Some of them are not proofread. There's a wide variety in the stuff that I get. This one is pretty okay. Um, they know how to set up the beginning of the memo. They know that there should be little headers so that it's easy to read. And then they summarize what their findings were. They uh, separate separately submit their Excel data so that I can see what they did. Um, if their memo matches their Excel data, they can get full points for the memo, even if their Excel analysis was wrong. I'll dock them from the Excel. Um, the co-requisites. As I said earlier, this has been a real challenge for us. Um, they meet two hours per week. Our co-recs meet for a different number of hours, depending on which course they co-rec for. So um, for both college algebra and pre-calculus, they, um, sorry, for both college algebra and pre-calculus, they um, have a three-hour co-rec. For statistics, it's a two-hour I was wrong. For pre-calculus, they have a three-hour co-rec. For college algebra and statistics, they have a two-hour co-rec. And for contemporary math, they have a one-hour co-rec. Um, our second iteration, which we're rolling out this spring, is a uh, one hour just in time review which is not quite true and i'll come back and one hour of homework in the computer lab um i had it backwards i'm actually teaching the correct this semester and i had it totally backwards for the first five weeks of the class their homework from week one is due on the wednesday of week two my correct meets tuesday and thursday and so what they do um is have i had them doing like a review on tuesday and then a um, like homework hour on Thursday, but that of course was backwards because then their homework was always very late. So we did it the other way. And now they're actually spending two hours um, a week really just doing their homework. And I think that's a really good, helpful way to do that. Um, they seem to really like knowing that they can come in and get their homework knocked out before it's due. They really like knowing they can ask me almost anything. Um, 
I've had some weird conversations actually. I had a student a few weeks ago say like, okay, so I saw this commercial about one of these potential medications and it said that the improvement was blah, blah, blah. What does that mean? And so all of a sudden we're pulling up on YouTube these um, commercials and watching them and talking about why they have to list 5,000 side effects and um, whether or not you should take this drug, right? And, and when you would and when you wouldn't and uh, yeah, really interesting things. And then we talk about what they asked, like what does a 5% increase mean? Um, so there's good stuff there. Um, prerequisites are hard. If, you, if you're implementing them, you have my empathy. They have really pushed us in lots of ways. Um, I'm going to just put all of those up so they're bright. Um, finding the right instructor is a super big challenge. We want somebody in there who is content knowledgeable, but empathetic, but willing to be kind of freestyling. You have to respond to what the students need on that particular day and you can't necessarily go in with a plan because you're almost always wrong about where they're struggling. Um, the weekly meetings really help our co-rec instructors. They know what the story is from the point of view of the um, other faculty teaching the college level version. So they know, and it also keeps our college level people synchronized, but the co-rec instructors then know the context of the problems, the, the questions that they're answering. They know why students are being asked to do such and such. And they also know which things the students are being asked to do by hand and which things they're being asked to do in Excel. So um, a lot of the Hawks homework has data sets in it. We have them copy the data into Excel, do their calculation in Excel, and then pop the answers back into Hawks, and it works pretty well. Um, occasionally we have a rounding error problem, um, but because they're allowed a certain number of strikes, it, it doesn't actually mess up their mastery. Um, when we first started Corex, we had some trouble convincing the instructors to convince the students that the Corex would be helpful. That's getting better. Um, now that the instructors and the students are all kind of getting the messaging about what a Corex is for and why we have them and why they're important. Um, in the fall, we had horrible attendance problems for our staff Corex. Very, very, very horrible. Like nobody would show sometimes all week. Um, we're working on that. Uh, that goes back a little bit to finding the right instructor. So like I said, I'm teaching that co-rec right now. And when my students walk in, I say to them, oh, who was seeing so-and-so? Well, why don't you text him? Tell him he's supposed to be here. Why have I not seen him this week? Has anybody seen so-and-so in any of her other classes? Why don't you make sure that she's okay? I've emailed her three times, tell her to respond to my emails. And I, I think that really makes them want to come, maybe not want to come, that's strong, but willing to come because they know that I'm asking about them specifically. Um, the weekly meetings really help with the alignment. Um, and we're still kind of struggling with that, that format. Um, we said that our theme for this year was continuous improvement. Um, we're working on courses over and over and over again, trying to make them better and better and better until we get them to a point where it's going to be okay for the students, where the students are going to feel comfortable, where we have things designed well. The problem with that for the Corex is that means that every semester it's a new course because the students need different things. And so they are by far the most work for instructors. Once you get the college level course kind of stable and the content stable and the pacing pretty good so that the instructors feel like they have time to do it and the students feel like they have time to get the homework and they're getting most of their questions answered, the co-rec is still changing constantly. Um, the weekly meetings, I love these and I hate them. So as Danny said at the beginning, I'm director of the first year math experience. That means I coordinate the college algebra sections, the pre-calculus sections, intro to stat, contemporary math, and then we're rolling out in fall of 2020, um, business math, intro to business math, or math for business and social science applications or something like that. Um, they all have co-recs, and then we still have one standalone developmental. Um, so that means that I, well, and I'm meeting with the pre-cal one and pre-cal two instructors every week too. So that means that I'm holding six half hour meetings per week. Um, trying to get all the instructors together and get everybody on the same page for each of those individual courses. Um, there are times where everybody comes in and things are going fantastically. <clears throat> and there are times where everybody comes in and people are really frustrated and having trouble. Um, and so it's, it's hard to know what you're gonna get on any given week, but it's fantastic 
to um, get everybody together and build that community and have them really feel like they're they're in it, if that makes sense. Um, we spend a lot of time reworking curriculum. Like I said, project number one for the stat course, I'm rewriting again. Um, they don't like it. So since they don't like it, I am just trying to make this go away. Um, since they don't like it, I'm trying again to kind of rework that curriculum and refocus the, the project. The, the data set's too messy for a first project. The students don't have enough experience. So what do we want that to look like? Um, we've talked a lot about pacing. I think college algebra is almost okay. I think pre-cal one and two are almost okay. Um, we're almost there for a couple of them. And for a couple of them, we're still doing some pretty hard rewrites. Um, I think this semester is going to be a semester for some pretty hard rewrites with the last third of the semester probably being online. Um, here's a question for everybody. If you have confidence intervals and hypothesis testing left, how much of that are you going to cover online? That's the hard stuff. So for real, if you have ideas about that, let me know. Um, I'm a little bit nervous about that being our, our last bit. Um, this is the email that all of the instructors get um, at the beginning of the semester, holding the time for their appointments. I send it through we use um, Outlook. So oh, I send it through Outlook so that it'll hold the time in their calendars. They should see it. Um, we almost never cancel. Um, we sometimes cancel right after an exam, but otherwise we meet and we just talk about what's next. Um, so one of the big challenges for us is that lots of people, maybe not lots, several people on campus still offer a stat course. Um, we offer intro to stat, psychology um, offers psych stat, and I'm pretty sure business offers business stat. Um, what we would love is for students to take intro to stat and then take psych stat. So they're trying to get to chi-square tests and things like that that we don't cover in intro to statistics. Um, the problem has been that we didn't have a unified curriculum and they were doing everything by hand. And so I think we're starting to be able to sell better to the psychology department and to their students why they should take intro stat first. They're gonna come out knowing how to deal with a messy data set. They're gonna come out knowing how to do some things in Excel. That makes the psychology department's um, program better. I mean, it makes their statistics course stronger because there are things that they should expect their students to know before they walk in the door. And so they can use some real data. Um, we're trying still to train faculty about why Excel is the right thing um, and how to use Excel. Not all of our instructors are super familiar with some of the aspects of Excel. We, most of us use it for grade books, but we might not know anything else. Um, the second half of the course, I have some Excel based materials, um, worksheets about hypothesis testing and things like that, that they can do in Excel, but frequently that stuff ends up being pencil and paper instead. And we're working on developing kind of modules that we can push out to instructors to make that more um, helpful, make it easier for them to continue to use Excel the entire semester. And really um, finding the right instructor for the COREX is super hard. So we want to make sure that we're um, really training those COREX instructors and we're really, really finding a right way to motivate the students. Why do you have to come to two extra hours of math a week? What is in it for you? Why is this okay? Why is this helpful? Um, like I said, I am open for any suggestions, especially about how to put this last third of the course online right now. That is kind of my nemesis. Um, I'm super grateful. I'll give Hawks another plug. I'm super grateful to Hawks for the formatting of their content that with the um, learn practice certify modes in there, we can run a lot of stuff online that we would have a lot of trouble doing without that kind of support and without those kinds of materials. Um, many of our other courses are going to be harder to translate because we don't have access to the same kind of, of stuff already built into the course. Um, but if you have ideas for activities, um, preferably asynchronous learning, we have a lot of students who are caring for family members right now and probably won't be back on campus. So any of those ideas are, are much accepted. Um, thanks for listening and I will see what kinds of questions we have. I think I should, should I stop share, Danny? You can leave the share going. Okay. No problem. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for the presentation. We're already getting some questions here, so we'll work to address those. Um, Cody asks, 
which of the Hawks stat textbooks are you using, um, beginning statistics or discovering statistics and data, and uh, why that textbook? We are using discovering statistics and data. They have um, a lot of data sets. I don't know that much about the other one, but what we really wanted to make sure is that the text was focused on um, interpretation of results, not calculation of results, that it was full of um, real data examples. Um, and it does have, discovering statistics and data does have links to tons of data sets, um, which are really, really nice. Um, and they also have an Excel link where you can like click on the Excel and it gives you the commands for all the possible things it would want you to do with the data sets. Um, it fit really well with our new vision of what we wanted the course to be about interpretation and data centered instead of calculation. So this is a, a shameless plug from Cody, but I'm, I'm happy to read it. What are your summer, uh, some of your favorite features of Hawks? I know you addressed some of them, but I'll, I'll ask uh, if you have any other ones. Um, I love, oh my gosh, there's actually a lot. We are um, implementing Hawks in both the statistics course and the college algebra course, and we're having good success in both of those. We're using a different product for um, pre-calculus one and two, um, which has its own strengths. It's a very different crowd. Um, I love being able to very easily customize the content. So for instance, there are some things in the Hawks data sets where which we as a group, as a community decide we're not going to use, we're not going to cover that content. And it's super easy to include or exclude. It's super easy to adjust mastery level so that, um, I think I'm gonna to have to do this in the next couple of days when our students are having trouble with a topic or um, we need to move quicker or something like that. Instead of deleting content, what I can actually do is just give them an extra strike. Um, I love that most of my students know to do practice before they certify. I like the fact that it's really a good balance between having them do kind of traditional homework and mastery grading. Um, that really seems to work well for both our pre, I'm sorry, for both our college algebra students and our intro stat students. It's the right format for them because they need some, rote practice isn't the right thing, but they need some kind of more traditional practice, but I also want them to demonstrate mastery at the end. And Carlos asks, are the corrects linked to the primary course so that they must pass uh, both in order to pass the primary course? And he said that he's asking because uh, you had mentioned that students do feel free to skip that co-requisite section sometimes. Yeah, so that's really complicated. Um, so the official rule, and I'm not gonna state this very well because it's a mess. The official rule is in order to be college ready in mathematics, they either have to pass their co-requisite course or their college level course. If they pass the co-rec, they can retake the college level if they failed it without retaking the co-rec. Or if they pass the college level, they'll have the F on their transcript for the co-rec if they failed that one, but they can move on and it does, it's no harm, no foul. The, um, the, the students were thinking, and so, so some of this was um, aggravated by some of the instructors, just kind of not promoting the value of the co-rec. Um, some of the students and some of the instructors were thinking that all I need to do is get the students to pass the college level. So if they pass the college level, they're college ready, everything's fine. And so the co-rec is really not necessary. Um, what we have implemented in the meantime, first of all, we're selling it better. Um, but what we've implemented in the meantime for many, though not all of the co-recs is if you pass the college level and you completed and tried, the co-rec was a course, we'll give you a pass in the co-rec. We finally managed, so part of the problem was, um, this is our first semester where the co-recs are pass fail. And so previously they were graded. And so it got really, really difficult. Um, so if they pass the college level course and they have missed no more than two of the co-requisite meetings and have done everything we've asked them to do in the co-rec, they can get a pass in the co-rec, even if they got like twenties on the quizzes or whatever. I hope that was the answer. <laughs> that makes sense to me. Yeah, thank you. Uh, one more question. How do you teach probability with normal distribution? Is that uh, Excel code or using a standard normal table? We actually still use the standard normal table. Um, the Hawks has access to the standard normal tables in the homework. Um, 
we only cover normal distributions. We've really kind of um, cut back on the content in the course in certain ways because of what the story of the course is. We want them to have certain fundamental skills that will translate to later. So we do use the standard normal in the T tables, um, but we don't do binomial distributions. We don't do geometric distributions. We don't do Poisson. We, there's lots of things we don't do because we don't need it. Um, when we get to hypothesis testing and confidence intervals, they need to know how to use the standard normal and the T distributions, but they don't need any of that other stuff. So we hope that they'll pick that up when they need it for a different application, a different course, and that they'll understand sampling distributions well enough to do that. Um, but we do stick with the standard normal and the T. Um, it's something we're talking about, actually. This is part of the continuous improvement. Okay, thank you. And uh, Femi, I do see your question about the PowerPoint slides. Uh, we have those and we'll be linking them on the same uh, virtual summit homepage that we're linking all of the recordings from all of our presentations throughout the week. So those will be accessible if you wanna go grab one of the links that were um, you know, spaced throughout here or look at anything else that was offered throughout the presentation. Um, well, I, I wanna thank our audience again for coming today. Um, thank you again, Doctor, for your presentation. I, if anyone does have any more questions that you think of later on, um, you know, there's the email address up on the screen, or you can email us directly at marketing at hawkslearning.com. Um, like I said, we will be emailing out a link to all the recorded sessions at the end of the week. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you. Bye.